Good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN. Happy New Year to everyone. And I'm really excited to welcome you to tonight's presentation uh, featuring a conversation between Melissa Korn, Jennifer Levitz, and Ashby Jones, all reporters for the Wall Street Journal. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice, among others. We have over 100 videos of past events archived on our website and our YouTube channel, so please be sure to explore. And now, formal introductions. Melissa Korn returns to us. You may recall Melissa was here interviewing Jeff Salingo last month, so now she's here as the featured guest. She's a higher education reporter for the Wall Street Journal, where she writes about college admissions, university finances, and recently, schools' responses to the coronavirus pandemic. She joined Dow Jones in 2007, first writing breaking corporate news for the Dow Jones Newswire's Spot News Desk, and then covering for-profit colleges, student lenders, alcohol, and tobacco for The Wire. She moved to the journal in 2011 to cover business education, workplace issues, and college to career pathway. Jennifer Levitz is a national reporter who covers general news, economics, politics, and daily life in New England and beyond from the Wall Street Journal's Boston Bureau. She was on the team that was a finalist for the 2015 Pulitzer Public Service Award for a series highlighting the cancer spreading risk of a common medical procedure. She worked previously as a reporter for the Providence Journal where she was on a Pulitzer finalist team for coverage into the causes of the Rhode Island nightclub fire. And last, as deputy chief of US News at the Wall Street Journal in New York, Ashby Jones helps manage a team of about 50 reporters and editors throughout the country who cover a wide variety of topics from real estate to immigration to education and white collar crime. Mr. Jones ran the Law Bureau at the Journal from 2016 until last year, and he helped lead a series of stories on hush money payments connected to Donald Trump that won the 2019 Pulitzer Prize in national reporting. It is a pleasure to have these three fabulous human beings here. Take it away. Thank you so much. Uh fan uh, and, and Lonnie, this is, uh, this is great. It's a huge honor. And we're all, um, the three of us have been chatting about this. We were chatting about it all day and we're, we're very um, excited to be here. Um, my name again is Ashby Jones um, and I help run the coverage of US News at the Wall Street Journal. Um, and that includes our education coverage. Um, and that means I was fortunate enough last year to help oversee much of our excellent coverage of the college admission scandal, which was led by uh, Wall Street Journal reporters, Melissa Korn and Jennifer Levitz. Um, that reporting and also a lot of other reporting that didn't make it into the journal uh, culminated into their e excellent book, um, which was published last year, titled Unacceptable, Privileged Deceit and the Making of the College Admission Scandal. Uh, you know, working with Jennifer and Melissa was an editor's dream, um, partly because they were on top of this story from, from start to finish. It began in March of 2019, really in relatively straightforward fashion with the arrest and charging in Boston of several parents accused of, of using fraud to get their kids into some of the country's most elite colleges and universities. Um, but the story quickly grew really complicated, actually. And, and this web of, of people, schools, um, and, 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 and names, which included coaches, administrators, parents, um, middlemen, facilitators. It, was, it really grew into a, a sprawling um, and, and complex web. Uh, and Jennifer and Melissa were on top of it every step of the way. When there weren't court hearings, the two of them were digging into the backgrounds and lives of all the participants to give Wall Street Journal readers the clearest picture possible of what happened here. Um, the result of the dogged work is this wonderful book. It's a great read, really, really well told. And Melissa and Jennifer do a great job contextualizing what happened here. And the story really does lend itself to broader contextualization because this really isn't just a story about education. It's at bottom an American story. It's, it's one that touches on a lot of different facets of American life, wealth and class, celebrity, privilege, uh, and intimate relations, how husbands and wives behave with each other and how parents relate to their children. 
Uh, with that, I will um, stop talking and uh, turn it over to uh, Jennifer and Melissa. My first question, um, I think I will go to Jennifer with this one. Um, Jennifer, uh, the name Rick Singer hasn't been mentioned yet, but um, it's almost uh, sort of de rigueur to start our conversations, I think, with a little bit of an unpacking of who Rick Singer was, I believe, you know, he's been called the mastermind. He's sort of the thread that runs through the book. He's the thread that ran through a lot of our coverage. Um, maybe you can, uh, I think it's a good place to start to talk about um, this, this sort of central character, Mr. Rick Singer, um, who he was and what was he's accused of doing and, and just what kind of person he was. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the data story broke. I remember at the press conference, they had a big poster board and they had the face of this man in the middle. I, no one recognized him. There was all these famous people involved, but who is this? And he's got arrows out from him to all these other people. Um, and it was very appropriate because uh, Rick Singer was a rather obscure person before this day, but he was absolutely at the center of this enormous coast to coast education scam that he'd been running for years. And essentially how it worked is, so, so Rick Singer to back up is a college counselor and he is a legitimate college counselor. You know, at the time he had a legitimate business and he was by all, everything we've heard quite good at it legitimately. Um, he had, he gained a following among wealthy parents first in Sacramento, then in the Los Angeles area and then around the country. And he built it and built it, um, but he had an illegal side to his business that just grew and grew. And so you could go to Rick Singer and you could do the traditional thing or you could, you could go off menu and get his dark offerings. And he had two um, main, main prongs to the scheme. He would, on, on one hand, you could, um, he could set you up to take a test to rig your SAT or ACT. We can get into that, but he actually controlled two testing sites. Um, then the other one, the bigger one, people probably heard a lot about was he could get you in as an athlete whether or not your kid played the sport. And he did that by bribing the people who made these decisions about walk on athletes and so, so on, get you a spot there. Um, and he did this for, you know, we, we know there's more than 50 parents um, whose names have come up, but many, many more. He had connections at all these schools and he was a, uh, a coach himself he was somebody who wasn't, he didn't grow up rich or anything, but he just was a very competitive guy and he had a lot of charisma and he had a real certainty about him. And he just, that was intensely appealing to people who were at this anxious time in their lives. This guy, fast talking, he knew everything. I can fix this for you. I can do this for you. And I think he was just a very alluring character to these parents. And 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 walk us through, just, just to keep on this theme for a second, just Walk us through how it would happen. Uh, uh, just a, a typical situation, um, word of mouth, however it happened that parents and kids would get connected to Mr. Singer and they would show up, I, I assume somewhere in Southern California and they'd meet at his office or at the parents' home. And, and, and what would happen? What would the pitch be like? You're right. Well, he would, uh, one of his things is he, he traveled, he went around everyone's home, so you didn't have to go to him. And he'd show up and it was different, in different cases, um, there were some cases where people came right to him and they wanted something illegal. In other cases, it was months walking over the line where he'd get together with them. But at some point, he would tell them, you know, look, I can make this happen for you. And here's how he would explain it. He'd say, you know, you can go in the front door, which is merit-based. You can go in the back door, which is to pay a huge donation, but that's not gonna guarantee you anything. Or you can go in the side door and that's what I have. And he would offer this guarantee to these, these families and he would start working with them to make the phony profiles. Um, and we can talk more about like how it was amazing to, we were so curious, like how do you go from, you know, I'm hiring you to tutor my kid, range for tutors to, to committing a felony and it really was different in many cases. There was definitely some parents who called him up and was like, I heard what you can do. Like, I want this done. And his name traveled in circles and he would do like, you know, he'd have like several clients, including on some boards uh, at private schools in Orange County. And his name just, you know, he became the guy that could get your kid in. I think one of the reasons that he was so successful at this was that he really uh, kind of picked at that, that, 
sore point that so many parents have that weakness of, I want to do what's right for my kid. I want to give my kid every opportunity possible. And he was really good at making sure they knew that their kid was nobody special, that they weren't a shoe in at the top schools or even at media, you know, what the family might have considered mediocre colleges. Uh, and, you know, all the work that they were doing, the test prep, the extracurriculars, that wasn't enough anymore. So he would kind of bring them to this level of insecurity that, uh, and then he would say, but I have a fix for you. I have a guarantee for you. And they would often be so desperate for that. Uh, you know, not to say that Singer manipulated them in any way. Everybody was a willing party in this, but uh, he was very good at understanding and kind of uh, playing up that, that insecurity. And, and you guys, you, you talked to, you mentioned earlier, Jennifer, about how he controlled a couple of testing sites, but it, in, in regard to the universities and colleges themselves, he did have, with some, he didn't really have an in with them, but he would still sort of ply these dark arts. And with others, he did have an in, right? He would know, he knew a coach or he knew somebody who, from the inside who could help him sort of manipulate things, right? Yeah, he had, he was amazing at building and maintaining relationships over many, many, many years. So uh, in, when he was working the athletic scheme, he had a number of coaches uh, at schools, including Stanford and UCLA, USC, Georgetown, UT Austin, and Yale, uh, and Wake Forest, I'll throw that one in there too. Was, uh, coaches from all of those schools had been charged in the case. Uh, and you know, he, he understood a lot of their pain points, just like he did understood some of the weak spots that parents had. Uh, these coaches weren't paid very well, at least not relative to their football or men's basketball counterparts. They were being pressured to raise funds for their school. Uh, they, you know, had to fill these spots. They had to, they, they had to do a lot. And he, uh, you know, dangled this offer of, you know, flag one of my kids as a recruit or as a walk-on. Uh, some money might go to the program, some money might go to you. And depending on the coach, that split was, was a little different. Um, some took a little more for themselves. Um, and, you know, he, he was able to use those coaches, in fact, to introduce him to other coaches. So there were kind of a few gatekeepers who would introduce him around, to, oh, you know, I can connect you to this other soccer coach. There were a bunch of soccer coaches. There were people from the same schools that would, you know, go talk to him. He'll explain how this all works. Uh, and, you know, they, they were all kind of in this club together. And, and what one of, uh, I, I, a really interesting point that I think came out in, in the reporting and in the book is that you think of you think of schools like Yale and, and Stanford um, as you know anybody who works there is going to be pretty well paid if they're a sailing coach or a soccer coach or a fencing coach. But the truth is that a lot of these coaches are, are not that well compensated. It's a sort of a part time job or it's a full time job, but it just isn't well that well paid and the benefits maybe aren't all that great. And so that was it's sort of a weak point. It's a little bit of a a, a point to be exploited, right? That you can pay these coaches and and supplement their salaries when they're not making a lot of money, at least as compared to other people who work at the university. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. There was a, a good example of that is the Georgetown coach. Um, he has pleaded not guilty. He's a, the Georgetown tennis coach and he coached men, men's and women's tennis. And he made, um, we learned he made 60,000 a year. And he was in an environment where when some, some of these sports, you know, you're surrounded by a lot of wealthy people, the, the families, and he's in a wealthy area. And he coached like ambassadors kids on the sides and you know, politicians kids. And he coached at a, a country club. And he, from all our reporting, I mean, he wanted more. He wanted more things. He wanted more, you know, a bigger house. And Rick Singer came along and, um, you know, offered him that. And, um, I think that, that you hit it right on the head. And he would play into that. He would say to some of these coaches, like, um, you know, you, you deserve more. You deserve more here. They're not paying you enough. And I think one of the, something that fascinated me as we reported this out was, uh, so prosecutors say that that coach, Gordy Ernst, took, got about $2.7 million through his relationship with Rick Singer and also did deals outside of Singer. So just on his own directly with parents. Again, prosecutors say he has pleaded not guilty. Uh, but I think it was just so interesting to see that there were coaches doing this work outside of Rick Singer. Uh, there were parents 
doing this, you know, engaging with coaches outside of Rick Singer that, uh, and, and there were perhaps other coaches not charged who also had deals going with parents. Um, there was a case of a, a Penn basketball coach um, a couple of years ago that, you know, they, this wasn't just a couple of bad apples, right? This was, this was such um, a weakness in the system that was so easily exploited by so many people for quite a long time. Uh, that yes, this case just brought a lot of that to light, but it wasn't just about the arrangements that Rick Singer was able to make. And and talk, um, maybe Jennifer, if you could talk, you, you had mentioned earlier on and, and sort of uh, alluded to it very sort of casually, this notion that Singer controlled two test centers. I mean, that it, you know, two SAT or ACT um, testing centers in, I, I think it was in Southern California, how does that happen? How does one man effectively um, come to control, uh, you know, centers which really should should be um, pretty well secured? You would think. Yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty creative. You have to you have to say, like, when he started out in 2011, he did the standard thing where he got this guy, um, this guy Mark Riddell, who is this. He's Harvard. Um, he's just super smart, and he taught SAT prep at IMG Academy in Florida. Uh, a very um, expensive boarding school, and he's just this, you know, brilliant guy. So he had him go and take tests for kids at centers. He was flying around Canada. He was like going in, and the security was bad, so he was just pretending. He's using fake IDs. That came to a crashing halt um, because of another similar scam. So the SAT changes and ACT like start to really beef up security. So Singer has to get creative. So what he does is he finds two schools, you know, kids go to like a high school on the weekend, a Saturday to take the test. And the people manning it are usually just the school teachers or other staff that are taking on like an extra job to be, you know, proctors at this place that day. So if he can get to two places and sort of control the test site, and if they can then let Mark in to take the test for the kid or sit next to him and feed answers. So again, he's really clever and he figures out who he can get to do this. You're, you're probably not gonna get a very exclusive school to do this. Like, so he, he found a school in Houston, a public school, and through someone he found a very, um, you know, someone who was hardly paid anything. Uh, she'd lost her home in Katrina. Uh, she was a, a teaching assistant um, and he got someone to bribe her and he never paid them all that much. You know, he was making a lot and he was like 2,000, 5,000, let my guy in. So that was his Houston site. And then he did the same thing at a school in West Hollywood, a struggling private school, just, you know, kind of crumbling and everything. And, and they, it was like a, a um, Ar Armenian or a Russian school. And he went there and he, he, the guy was, they were in all this debt. And he's like, look, I can give you money um, to, if you just let my guy in. And so he, that's how he set it up. So when you made your deal with him, you know, you'd picked, you'd go to Houston or you'd go to West Hollywood. And then all these families who lived all around the country would have to make up some reason. He'd, he'd, he'd work with them on that, you know, tell your, because the schools want you to go to their school. And you have to figure, kind of say, well, I'm not going to take it there. We're going to be in Houston at a wedding or looking at, um, you know, a school or, or family event or something. So you'd make up a reason and you'd fly in and um, the, the kid would go there and a, a major part of his scam is um, you had to have accommodations, special accommodations to take the test uh, like by yourself or in a special way. So he would arrange to get the kids designated as learning disabled. So they would go to the school and they'd be in a private room or maybe just a couple other kids. And then Mark Riddell would go in and he would either sit by the kid and say, tell him what to answer. Or once they left, he would fill it in. Uh, it was just quite the well-oiled machine. <laughs> it's it's it, it, it's it's really um, it's really amazing, and the and the fact that this went on for you know years and years and years, um, you know, relatively undetected, is 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 just um, sort of astounding, given the brazenness of of it all. You know, um, so shifting gears a little bit, uh, one of my one of my favorite chapters in the book. Um, is uh, the title of it is something like um, standing on third base or or on third base and and the metaphor is that that these are are kids who um, and parents who are not at great disadvantage uh, financially um, 
they're not at great dis disadvantage in, in a lot of other ways. Uh, the, the, you know, these are, these are sons and daughters of prominent lawyers, people in Hollywood, um, people who uh, work in finance, who have money, who are well-connected. And so it raises this question, if these kids were on third base and um, you know, probably gonna get into a school, a good school, maybe not Harvard or Yale, but a good school, and, and after college, are probably going to do just fine because they have um, the backing and the support of um, of parents who know how to play the game, parents who are well connected, and parents who have money. Frankly, so so why? Again, it goes to what you said earlier, Melissa. Why, if these are effectively kids who didn't need the help, why were parents willing to cross the line in this way for them? So there were a lot of motivations for the different parents. And in the book, we get into kind of some of those specific cases because they really did range quite a bit. But uh, ultimately, a lot of it came down to, for, for many of these parents, this idea that success is measured uh, by admission to a very short list of colleges. So going to local state U is a great success for many families, but these parents did not consider that success. And frankly, the high schools that the kids attended also didn't really consider that a success. They really only highlighted, you know, the Ivy Plus institutions. Uh, uh, the, the short list was very, very short. So they understood that the chance of getting into these schools was quite low, uh, even for very qualified applicants, right? The admit rates were 15%, 10%, at Harvard now under 5%. Um, so they knew that even if their kid was pretty good or even great, that this wasn't a sure thing. And in their mind, the kid needed to go to that school, whether it was to keep them, keep them on the right path or to have them make the connections they needed or because the parent wanted bragging rights, right? It's all about the bumper sticker. And, you know, especially for a lot of these families in Southern California, USC was the hot destination. And uh, as, as we had one college counselor describe it, you know, parents would crawl through, crawl through glass to get their kid in there. Um, so it really was just this very, Jennifer has used the word myopic, this, this, just this really skewed worldview of what constitutes success and why it's okay to cross the line to go there or the lies that parents would tell themselves to make themselves feel better about it. You know, that, oh, well, these other kids get other kinds of advantages, so I need to help my kid or, you know, the competition is just too great or, you know, Rick Singer told me he wouldn't get in anywhere. Like, well, no, not necessarily. Maybe Singer said he won't get into any of these schools on your list, but that's obviously quite different from he won't get in anywhere. And and what about what about what about the kids themselves? Um, to what degree were they aware of what was going on? Um, to what degree were they victims? Were they complicit? Were they um, just uh, beneficiaries of this? I mean, how would you characterize the role of? I mean, these aren't nine and ten year olds. These are you know seven, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen year old, eighteen year old kids. Uh, it, it ranged. Uh, there were some kids who really were brought in as participants. They, they knew that, um, that Mark Rudell was coming in to take the test. They, the parents, you know, they knew what was going on. They were in meetings with Rick Singer. They were told, you know, don't tell anyone. They were part of um, the, the idea of like portraying themselves as athletes, you know, sending essays to the coach about, oh, I spent the summer playing in tournaments. Um, and then on the other side, there were parents who absolutely did not want their, their kids to know. And that was a huge thing. They, they were terrified that, you know, they would feel that the parents didn't think they were good enough. So they went to great lengths to hide it from, from the kids. And of course, they all ended up, you know, finding out. And um, it was a big question in the beginning, right away, the very first day, will the kids be charged? Because um, as you said, they were, by now, some of them were, you know, 19 and, 20 years old. And, and when this happened, they were like 17. And um, in the, the US attorney said, you know, it's kind of fair game at this point. And we're looking at that. And we kept waiting, thinking that there were several, because some of them really were, they were on the phone with the parents. 
but you know, it was clear that the parents were the primary players, I mean, no matter what, like the parents had arranged it with Rick Singer and they had put their kids in a really bad spot, especially the ones that made them like accomplices to this. And um, they never did charge the kids. They did use that, hang that over the parents. And we think, you know, probably try, got them to plead that way. They sent some target letters to some of these kids, like you may be charged. And then very quickly the parents pleaded. Um, but the, the parents paid a price. Um, they, they paid a premium in sentencing. Um, if you had brought the, your son or daughter into this, um, you got extra time. And the judge was very you, mad about that. You, you guys got some really good um, stuff, I think, that, that shows up throughout the book, uh, but, but, uh, but really sort of is at the end of the book with one of the, one of the, the kids, um, Matteo Sloan. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about, I thought he was very reflective and had some interesting things to say. Can, can you guys maybe walk through his story a little bit and, and, and talk, about, talk about where he came down at the end of it all? Sure. Yeah, he's um, Matteo Sloan is the son of Devin Sloan. And in, in the book, you'll notice we don't use a lot of the real names for the kids, but we did with a few because they spoke out and they agreed to use their name. And Matteo Sloan was one of them. And the way he set, described it is he was going to, to a very good private school in Los Angeles. He was working very hard. He was taking AP classes. He was staying up till two in the morning. He was doing clubs and summer programs and sports and really trying. And he had a list of colleges and he wasn't, you know, a top of his class. He was just like a solid, you know, higher B plus kind of student, good kid, um, liked the environment, liked to surf, um, had a list of colleges that were for him reasonable, UC Santa Cruz, different places. Along comes Rick Singer and suddenly everyone's pushing him to go to USC and he gets in and he's just, you know, he, he said that he just flowed along um, and he just sort of did what his parents wanted. And come to find out, um, they got him in by, by presenting him to USC as a water polo player. Um, he did not play water polo. So he's 20 years old, he's at college, he's doing well, and he's at USC and um, his dad uh, gets arrested um, March of you know, 2019. And he learns like the rest of the nation that his father has, has cheated to get him into USC. He's home on spring break. He's just horrified. Um, his father is, spends the day in lockup and walks in the door at night. And um, Mateo looks at him and says, um, you know, how could you not have believed in me? And, you know, it's just heartbreaking. And what he said is um, what made him so mad was that, first of all, he worked so hard. So he's like, why did I work hard? Um, secondly, all those times that his parents had told him they were proud of him, like, was that a lie? Were they not proud of him? So he went through this real like self-doubting period. But then he said he started to feel sorry for his dad. You know, his father apologized and the country was piling on his father, you know, who, who looked like ridiculous. You know, he like bought stuff. He posed his kid as a um, water polo player. Um, that's a whole nother kind of a strange story of how he got Mateo to be in the pool and think that. But um, so he's like, you know, he ended up sort of forgiving his father. And I think he came out of it a stronger person. I mean, he, he said that he realized he needed to speak up. And in, in, in hindsight, there'd been times where he just hadn't spoken up. He just did what everybody around him expected. And he'd kind of become his own person through this. But his yeah. main message, his main takeaway was, you know, we said, what was your, what should parents learn? He's like, you know, give your kids some breathing room. And um, he, the, the word he used, he said, you know, it's great to be invested in your kid. You know, there's nothing wrong with putting, giving them everything, you know, but um, when you're too, he could tell that, that some of the parents were so invested, like we knew they were too excited at our accomplishments and all our things. And his word was that it was gross. <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, it's really some of the most powerful stuff in, in the book when, when you get to Matteo Sloan. Um, we have a couple questions from the audience here. Um, uh, one, they both refer back to uh, to Rick Singer, so I thought we could we could uh, deal with them now before moving on. One is how long was the scheme with the coaches going on, based on what you were able to document? Yeah, so the um, the criminal case that came out of Boston was mostly uh, started at 
they, they looked at and charged families that were involved from 2011 on. But we know at least one instance where uh, Rick Singer kind of worked his magic uh, to get a student in in 2008. And there are indications that it was from even that, that he was working these deals even before then. We know that Singer certainly was stretching the truth and encouraging his clients to do so quite a few years before that uh, from talking to people who kind of worked with him or knew him back in in the, the late night by the late 90s he uh, there were, were instances where he was encouraging somebody to uh, fib about their race or ethnicity on an application or to play up just how you know oh they they were on some fantasy football team uh, no they created this whole big league and they you know just kind of extreme embellishments. Uh, so he had kind of crossed over that line of what's okay and what's not quite a bit earlier. Uh, but in terms of working with the coaches, again, uh, we at least 2008 and likely a little bit earlier than that. And, and the, the next question is actually uh, perfectly timed. What, what's happened to him since? Uh, okay, so Singer was, uh, and we can get into kind of the, the criminal case a little bit, uh, but he cooperated with investigators. So he flipped and he handed over uh, his Rolodex and a whole lot of information. Uh, after they had a wiretap up on him, he agreed for them to keep uh, recording his calls. And he had scripts that he would follow to kind of continue talking to some of his clients and close out some final deals. He pleaded guilty to four charges, including obstruction of justice, which came on when he uh, tried to tip some of his clients off to the investigation. Um, so he pleaded guilty because he's a cooperator, he won't be, he likely won't be sentenced until after everyone else, right? So if everyone else is found guilty and um, that kind of looks good for him, right? He helped the government even more. So uh, he likely won't be sentenced until after the trials. And those uh, were originally scheduled for fall of 2020. Now they're scheduled for fall of 2021 for the parents and coaches who have pleaded not guilty. So he's out and about and finishing his PhD. Uh, and he, we, we get uh, text messages from people, of uh, Rick Singer spottings occasionally around the country, which is always fun. Um, I think that's him in the restaurant. Is this, does this look like him? And uh, so he's, he's out and about and trying to do some, you know, kind of good volunteer work while he's out. So out and about, but he will be likely facing some prison time on yeah, the other end of this. Pretty significant amount of prison time. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, again, uh, shifting gears a little bit and taking a little bit of a, a step back. Another one of my favorite chapters in the book um, is called The Gray Area. And this so sort of deals with this, you know, it, it, what you guys have just described, somebody coming in and taking over test centers, paying off schools to, to co-op their test centers, um, paying off coaches to accept the, you know, doctored uh, phony appl applications with, you know, um, with, uh, with doctored photos of kids playing uh, water polo or whatever, that, that is pretty clearly on the wrong side of right and wrong. However, you've got sort of what's been going on for a long time. You've got, you know, parents giving a lot of money to universities and the hope that their kid will get in. Um, you know, making promises in advance of, uh, of, of a kid applying to school saying, if my kid gets in, you know, you can expect that money will come in. Um, it, it just, it feels like there is a big gray area and, and this does not really have to do with what Rig Singer was doing, but can you guys talk just about how the admissions process um, there, there are shades of gray in what, what people do and what people can get away with um, and have, and it's been like that for a long, long time. Um, and this is just sort of maybe pushing the envelope to a great degree, but talk about, you know, I mean, I think people might have an, a notion that like, you know, colleges, well, there's a stack of applications. They look and they see, oh, the SATs and the extracurriculars and the GPA, admit, reject, admit, reject, and they sort them out like that. And I think in actuality, there's a, a lot more of this gray area um, 
uh, that that is at play in a lot of these applications? Yeah, so many of these very selective schools use what's called holistic admissions and uh, assuming the audience includes many parents of Chicagoland high schools, uh, you're probably pretty familiar with this from the college counseling offices. But um, so holistic admissions looks at a lot of objective factors like grades and SAT scores and uh, things like that, but also looks at a lot of subjective factors, you know, recommendation letters, extracurricular involvement, how much somebody maybe had to overcome in their life. And those are, again, hard to quantify. Uh, and that's not always something that parents want to hear, or that applicants want to hear, that it's just kind of more art than science as a college crafts its class. There are certain factors that absolutely get somebody special attention. So um, an interesting backstory, you know, having, having overcome something significant, uh, just having, having lived an interesting life, right? That, that college essay, uh, if it's really powerful, that can make a difference. Uh, other things that can really make somebody stand apart are, well, did mom and dad go to that school? Have they donated to that school? Are you a recruited athlete? Uh, when I covered the Harvard affirmative action case uh, that was uh, went to trial in federal court in Boston in 2018, uh, you know, we saw so much interesting information about just how much of an advantage some of these kind of categories of applicants get. So legacies, uh, donors, kids, faculty, kids, athletes, just heads and shoulders, better shot at getting in. And athletes stood above all the rest. Uh, you know, over a five-year period, about 86% of recruited athletes got into Harvard. Their overall admit rate at the time was between five and 7%. Um, so people talk, people kind of have a lot to say about who gets advantages, right? Who's, who's favored in college admissions these days, but ultimately it's the people who are wealthy and those with connections, uh, those often go hand in hand. So there, there are a lot of gray areas and it's, it's about kind of having those markers and being able to call, oh, you know, my, my uncle's on the board of trustees at the school or, you know, having someone write a recommendation letter who's a politician or something and those connections. But it's in, there's advantages and inequities and privilege in some much more innocuous ways as well. Who can afford to hire an SAT tutor? Who can afford to go on a community service trip to Guatemala? Who can afford a private tennis coach or a violin uh, instructor so that they can join, you know, the all-state orchestra? Uh, only certain people can can afford that, and then you've got the big donations, and then you've got what was happening with Rick Singer and his uh, his work, which is on the same spectrum, just at the extreme opposite end of it. Yeah, it's. Um... It's, uh, it's, 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 it's fascinating and, and you guys are not the first ones to, to talk about the, that and those advantages and the inequities baked into the system, but um, it's definitely woven throughout the, woven throughout the book um, in, uh, in a very subtle, um, in a very subtle way, but one that, that really does make an impact. Um, we, to, to go back to the, um, the one, one sort of question that loomed over some of the early court proceedings in the cases involved this question of victimhood. Um, and it came up because a lot of the defense lawyers would say, hey, look, you're bringing charges against my client, um, Mrs. or Mr. So-and-so, who was accused of having um, you know, paid off a coach or what have you, used Singer to do this or that. Um, but who's the victim? I mean, crimes typically have to have a victim on one end or the other in order for the state to get involved and get interested and use its weight um, to uh, and resources to to try to um, put somebody away or or extract a fine, et cetera. Um, and I'm not sure that that argument really carried the day because uh, they're really, you know, the, the, no, no. I, as far as I know, no judge said, "Yeah, this is a victimless crime. Everybody can walk." But I do think there was something to that, at least initially, you know. The, the kids weren't really victims, the ones that got in, the parents weren't victims. Um, the schools themselves, while they were um, cheated, suppose, you know, they didn't lose any money necessarily. It was very hard to quantify sort of who the victims were in this. And I, I'd love to hear you guys 
talk about um, what you think, who, who the victims were um, in this. If it was the people whose applications weren't considered because the slots were all taken up by these folks. Um, the honest kids who didn't use these means to get ahead. Who are the victims in this? I think, um, yeah, as you mentioned, so it, the, the fall of, of 2019, um, it literally looked like none of these parents were going to go to prison. Um, because, as you mentioned, this, the, the defense lawyers were, were, had been arguing, you know, there's, there's no real victim here. Um, there's, you know, who lost? The parents actually paid money. And the, um, in federal court, the probation department recommends the judge. They go and we, they, they quantify, it. here's the financial law. And the judge uses that to hand down sentences. They came back after studying this and said no financial loss because in, in some cases, the college had actually gained money because the parents were giving money to the program and then paying tuition on top of that. So you had a, you had people who'd never been charged, white collar defendants um, who already were in a you know a category of like zero to six months. And the defense lawyers, we were in court and they were like grinning because it looked like for sure their clients were going to get probation, uh, no financial loss. And um, but what they kind of didn't count on is that the judge indeed thought there were victims that just because you couldn't quantify it um, that there were victims because you know college is is kind of a, a zero-sum game you know they don't have endless spots and they give a certain number of spots out so if they give a spot to your kid um, then somebody else is not getting in there and so the the victims were were those students and that all the parents who sort of played by the rules. And it was, I remember it was a stunning day because it was the Felicity Huffman case. And she happened to pay the, uh, among the least of the parents. So if anyone was going to get probation, she was sort of the bellwether for this new finding had just come out, no financial loss. So we're like, well, there's no way that she's going to get Felicity Huffman anything. And she did, she gave her two weeks. So you saw all these defensors like ran out of the courtroom because you had people who'd given like $250,000. They're like, we've got to go back and rewrite our sentencing memos. And like they were, and sure enough, they've gotten now two weeks to, to nine months. And the, the judges, every time they go back to this idea, um, you know, there's several judges handling it and they go back to the idea that, you know, you have corrupted the college system. And that it's like in the United States, I mean, we like to think that you know, college is an e equalizer that you can get an education and you can do the right thing. And um, despite all these gray areas and all that, that, you know, you, you, you do have a fighting chance to get to a good school. And if you're qualified, you should get looked at. Um, but that's that those were the victims. And we actually did find, I'll just end on this. We did find some actual victims where, you know, Singer had literally taken off the internet photos of other kids, actual real athletes, and then superimposed his clients' children's faces on them. So we tracked down the real kids. And one of them was this young man in Texas who had, had, had spent, you know, just, you know, two years trying to get to the States. He lived in a little town. And that picture was the culmination of like two years of sweat and practicing every day till 10 o'clock at night. And they had just, with a click, stolen his picture off the internet and like plagiarized his life. That's a that's an incredibly powerful story. Uh, it it's really really amazing. You guys are down, and that's what I meant earlier by the dogged reporting. Um, that doesn't come doesn't come easily. Um, an, another question from the uh, from an audience member, um, and I don't know which one of you guys is best positioned to answer this one. Um, have you followed the path of Maury Tobin? What was his exact role, and what happened to him? Sure. So uh, I, I will start and then maybe Jennifer can can uh, jump in. But uh, it was actually a tip that Jennifer got that brought the name Maury Tobin into uh, kind of public chatter at all uh, with with a journal, a Wall Street Journal scoop that there was a tipster in an unrelated securities fraud case who had led investigators uh, to Rick Singer 
And then I believe it was a day later, we had a story uh, saying not only did this tipster, uh, you know, lead them to it, but he had engaged in a bribe as well. Uh, so Mari Tobin was this LA businessman uh, originally from Canada who uh, was paying off Yale's women's soccer coach at the time to get his daughter in as a recruit. And uh, Tobin was nabbed in this pump and dump stock fraud case. And he kind of agreed to plead pretty quickly and went into the prosecutor's office in Boston to talk through a little bit more about kind of his finances and his backstory and all that. And they noticed that there was money moving from one of his accounts to an account in Connecticut every month. And they asked him about it uh, because if he's gonna be going on the stand cooperating for the government, uh, they need to know everything about him. So, you know, why are these payments going and who, who's, who's getting this money? And he fessed up that it was, uh, Rudy Meredith, the Yale women's soccer coach, and explained the situation. And they arranged for him to meet Rudy Meredith in a hotel room for like another cash handoff. And they had, uh, you know, they were recording the whole thing. And at that meeting, Rudy Meredith mentioned Rick Singer's name. Now, Tobin wasn't working with Rick Singer. Uh, it just that Meredith happened to mention his name and uh, kind of a, wait, were you? the one through Rick Singer or were we just working directly? That kind of sort of thing. Um, Cause apparently he was doing enough with these deals with enough people <laughs> and prosecutors, you know, light bulb goes off. Oh my gosh, this is definitely way more interesting than a stock fraud. And uh, they chased that down for months. And that's what led to this entire thing unraveling even though it was such a complex case. Um, it wasn't, you know, somebody who, who blabbed one of Rick Singer's partners or a parent or a student or something it was almost by accident that it came down. So Tobin uh, was charged in this other case and kind of, we, we were able to tr you know, keep an eye on that stock fraud case while we were getting all of our courtroom alerts about uh, the Varsity Blues case. And he, and he went back to LA and he became kind of a pariah because he was a rat. And so these parents there who either had gotten in, they all were like, that's the guy that threw me under the bus. That's the guy that caused this. Of course you're like, well, you did it. You know, you signed up for it. But they were, you know, was, they were all really mad at Maury Tobin. Like he just wanted to save his own hide. And, you know, he led him to Rick Singer. Um, so he had a really rough time. And then just not long ago, he got sentenced. And it was pretty interesting because, you know, he had, he had basically, led them to the largest college admissions uh, scam ever investigated by the Department of Justice. He had given them the whole uh, stock fraud scam, people in all these countries. So he was like a double rat for the government. He brought them all these people and they thought they wanted, I mean, just a minuscule amount of time for him. And the judge slammed him with a year and everyone was shocked, you know, for all that work and, um, he was, um, he was an interesting guy. He was, um, he had, you know, he, he had lived in this, he always kind of lived above his means. He had just this ginormous house in LA with like 10 chimneys on it and, you know, Chateau style. And he had these uh, beautiful daughters that went to one of the finest private schools. And there was always a lot of resentment in the community because they all just had the charm. You know, they just went to, to an Ivy League school and several were really smart and got in, you know, legally, but there was the one. And um, so he, I, I don't know, he was, he was interesting. I think it's the parents who ended up sort of turning uh, cooperating witness were not popular back in their communities. Right. <laughs> not at all. And for all of you legal, legal nerds out there, that that's why, and I'm one of them. That's why I, this was so interesting to me. That's why this case was all brought in Boston, as opposed to LA where, where so much of it was centered. You'd think that maybe the prosecutors in Los Angeles would have brought this case, but the, that securities case was in Boston, right? So when the prosecutors heard about Rick Singer, they said, hey, this is ours. We're gonna wrap this up in all together and we're gonna bring this separate case in Boston. Yes. Yeah, one of the um, kind of fascinating things about this was that, right, the prosecutors were investigating this for many, many months um, from, the time Tobin walked into their office to the time the charges were announced was almost a year and it didn't leak. And that's astonishing. And there was so much kind of, uh, tur so many turf wars within various offices within the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston and LA and New York and 
those are pretty common. So for everyone to stay quiet on this and for people in LA to just not even know it was happening um, up until a few days before the arrests and they had to kind of plan out how to swarm the area and arrest you know, dozens of people at once um, it was, it, it was phenomenal and very rare. You don't see that in law enforcement very often to be kept under wraps quite that well. Yeah, our, our legal reporters were not working hard enough to try to <laughs> break this story before it before it uh, before it went down. Um, well, let's um, let, let's turn now to sort of you know uh, the I guess it's not the 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 end of the saga. It's certainly the saga continues, but there is a chapter at the end of the book on on reform and 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 lessons learned from this. Um, uh, both maybe from the parent side, but but more importantly from you know this the side of uh, of of colleges and universities and their admission systems. What, if anything, has been done, and and what are you, what if, what have you guys seen so far um, to try to sort of you know draw lessons from this uh, and uh, and make sure it doesn't happen again? I think one of the big takeaways of this whole scandal was that there is so much trust baked into the college admission system. And as long as there is that trust, there will be people breaking that trust. Uh, you know, that last chapter is called a system reformed question mark, which I think uh, is a pretty good hint at where we feel things have gone. There hasn't really been much change in response to the scandal. Uh, a few schools have said, okay, we'll make sure that people who are uh, admitted as recruits actually are on the rosters their freshman year. And if they're not, they better have a good explanation. A few have said, we'll audit a little bit more. You know, we'll, we'll call up a high school principal and ask, you know, was this person really the president of the club rather than the vice president? But they can't do that for everybody. And they just have to kind of believe that the, the applicants are being honest. And what surprised me, one thing that surprised me was how little the college board and the ACT did in response to this, just kind of, oh, well, those test site administrators were, must have been just, you know, bad seeds. Uh, don't blame us, Our, we are very secure, no problems here. And, you know, definitely give a good chuckle uh, to people who follow college admissions closely. What brought about the change in college admissions testing was the pandemic. Right? It wasn't this, the fact that people could pay off test site administrators and proctors to fix scores. It was people couldn't get to testing sites and that's when colleges went test optional. Uh, and it, it still kind of a, amazes me that that's what it took for us to see real significant change, um, at least for now in college admissions. I, I remember we, um... In, in, at some point in the course of, of the story and the course of our reporting, I remember the three of us sitting down or, or getting on a call and talking about if there's one Rick Singer, there must be another or, or there must be there must be five other people who are doing maybe not something quite as brazen, but but something along the line, something that's in the margins. And, you know, and, and we weren't able to really find that person um, and maybe that person doesn't exist, but what's, what's your guys' sense as to whether um, things are still really on the up and up? Was this just a lone, weird, isolated incident um, and, you know, you clean this one up and things can more or less go back to normal? Or do you think there is kind of, you know, there are more bad seeds out there that just haven't been caught yet? I think there. I think there. There's other ones. I, I remember talking with some counselors who said that this kind of thing uh, wasn't that uncommon in some other countries, like in China. And she goes, and she said, and actually, um, Rick Singer. At least he, he, you got. He was not your typical con man because you paid him and you actually got the product. <laughs> you know? She's like, there's a lot of people that were bilking people, like you know, you pay them and you wouldn't get anything. Like he actually delivered the thing, but we found some sort of mini Rick Singers in the past. Remember that guy that um, we were communicating with in federal prison? Um, he'd, 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 but, yes, he, you know, he'd sat in the same courtroom, but nobody covered it. Um, really, it was just a small story, but so I feel like there's mini Rick Singers out there. I don't know. Um, what do you think, Melissa? Absolutely. And I'll, I'll, I know we have to end on uh, end now, but I, I will end on this note that uh, ProPublica and one of our colleagues at the Wall Street Journal both reported on a story outside of the Chicago area um, of a, a counselor who was encouraging 
uh, clients to have their kids emancipated or to, to give up guardianship of their kids so that the kids could get more financial aid. And this was happening for students who were trying to go to UI, uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And it, it, you know, again, these are people who could afford to pay a private counselor to tell them, here's how to get more financial aid. Uh, so yeah, there's absolutely people, if not at his scale or at his level of sophistication, uh, there are plenty of other people like Rick Singer out there. And again, as long as people aren't checking everything that's on every college application, those people will continue to exist. This Sorry, has been, I'm so <laughs> This has been such a fascinating conversation. Ashby, you've done a great job with, your, uh, with these two reporters here, all three of you. Um, great conversation. I wanna give a quick reminder to attendees uh, we are going to have the after hours is going to start at about 805. Um, there's going to be plenty of Q&A cameras on talking with Jennifer and Melissa more about um, college admissions, their work and how all of this unfolded. So a quick reminder on that. And there's the commercial in chat there. So uh, get a book, a couple fast questions. Uh, did either of you uh, and do you attend to if the answer is no, did either of you interview Singer? So we um, we're not saying we did more than 150 interviews, and many people spoke with us uh, because the case is still going on at, on the agreement. We couldn't say who we spoke with. Um, so we have a note in the book that you know we we're not naming unless someone you know most people are unnamed. So we're okay. going to look kind of mysterious. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. AG um, journalists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we right. can't say we spoke to a lot of the primary players. Uh, there was a question submitted in advance um, asking if this kind of problem is an issue with graduate school admissions. Um, maybe Melissa, from your higher ed background, maybe have some thought on that. Uh, the test cheating certainly can be for the GMAT or the GRE uh, or the LSAT to some ex slightly lesser extent, I'd say with the LSAT probably. But um, yes, uh, it is. People will fabricate and embellish their resumes whenever they have an opportunity to do so. Not everybody will, obviously, and let's hope that most people are honest, but same kind of thing. There are absolutely opportunities. The one big difference is there aren't uh, recruited varsity athletes, athletes at graduate yeah. schools. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that closes one opportunity for them. One other question, someone had probably a quick yes or no as well on this is, did all of the schools open, uh, fire the coaches that had been uh, obviously caught? Yes. Are they all gone? Yes. Yes, pretty much that day, everybody was walked out. Yeah, not all the students got kicked out, but the coaches were fired. Okay, um, this has just been fabulous. Any closing thoughts for our friends as we have one minute left here? What else, anything else on your mind? Words of advice for parents still sweating the bullets? Well, I think that we've just, we've just scratched the surface and I'll just, we have, um, I think we, I'm proud of how in depth we get in the book into these into these stories, and we were determined to get beyond, um, you know, just the the headlines and to really like make this a narrative. And and so I, I would encourage people to read it because I I think it's important. As Ashby said, it talks a lot more about education, and I think everybody can recognize something in them of themselves or their community. I thought it was really good in terms of uh, different chapters, kind of focusing on different families, and you see. Um, although there are threads of commonality in some ways, which kind of um, looking at maybe psychological profiles of people, um, but it, it is interesting to see how, how in each instance, how it folded the, the peculiarities of each family and what led it to unfold. I mean, so many families were involved. It wasn't like it was just three families, you know, there's a, a lot of people involved. I want to thank both of you, Ashby. Thank you so much for coming and joining FAN. Uh, we really appreciate your service to our organization. And Jennifer and Melissa, we'll see you guys at about 8.05. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, look for the recording. We'll send out the recording in just a couple of days. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.